If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to be opening to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for the gifts of this day. Help us to believe what we just sang. Uh, my job today is not to be spectacular, it's to be faithful. So I pray that in Jesus' name, that you will send forth your spirit and renew the face of the earth. It's in Jesus I pray. Amen. Today we continue in our series, uh, Follow Me. And uh, if you're new to Homewood, uh, you've uh, picked a great time to be here uh, because uh, today you actually have a unique opportunity uh, to, to join in in a class that's going to happen right after our time of worship today. Uh, we call it our Catch the Vision class, and it's an opportunity for you to learn a little bit more about the mission and vision here at Homewood, but also for you to meet some leadership uh, and some ministry team leaders and to get to know them. Also a chance for you to maybe ask some questions about things that, that you have on your mind. I uh, would love to, to help you with those as well. Uh, so that'll be directly after service today, uh, just right out here in the foyer, take a, my left, and it'll actually be in the tri room. I know Brother Castleman said that the baby dedication class was going to be in the tri room. It's not. Uh, but if you come to the tri room, we will send you to where you need to, to be for that class. And uh, if you've already been through a Catch the Vision class, I, I want to invite you to, uh, to, to participate in another Bible class. There are several classes going on today. Um, it'll start, you know, about 15 minutes after worship. And so uh, they'll be on the screen here in a little bit. But uh, we are blessed uh, with some great uh, students of the Word here at Homewood, and they uh, pour into our class times. And, and so I want to encourage you, if you're not taking advantage of that, uh, that you will uh, make an opportunity, make, make yourself available to that today. I think it'll be a blessing to you and your walk with God. Uh, well, for the past few weeks, uh, we've been using, kind of started each sermon with a, a clip from the TV series, The Chosen. And uh, I'm not going to do that today. Um, but just in case that you need your, your chosen fix, uh, just know that uh, season four is coming out in theaters this week. So the first three episodes will be available in theaters. So if you need your chosen fix, you can get it this week. Um, but one of the things that, I, that, that the Lord just began impressing upon my heart was uh, it's great to see just some, some visual imagery of what it might have been like in Jesus's day uh, to to approach the disciples and to ask them to follow him. And I hope you've been blessed by that the, this past few weeks. Um, but one of the things the Lord's been impressing on my, my heart is, is what does it look like today? What does it look like in 2024 uh, for that same invitation to be extended uh, to us as believers in him? Uh, so if we will take a moment and watch the screen as one of our members shares how Jesus' call to follow him has impacted her life. Um, well, I guess for me, my journey that really brought me here was I found myself at a point in my life where i uh, 44 years old and I'm really starting over in life and that's a scary place to be and, you know, not really sure how to navigate that with two grown children and your whole life looking different than it did. And I knew that I needed something to happen. I didn't quite realize that it needed to be a spiritual uh, awakening, but I realized that my journey was going to have to, something was gonna have to change for me to really just have a fresh start. And that's where I found myself at, at a church where I could grow and grow spiritually and not just grow me but get to work you know where life takes you sometimes you can tend to to fall away sometimes and I think that's where I found myself you know when I just realized that you know hey I'm flat on my face and I, I need something I need I need a change that's really 
where your life can either go one direction or the other and I'm really grateful that God's voice was louder than anything else and I just really needed to uh, give it to God and that's where I found uh, this church home and for a while I'll be honest I was uh, still scared and so I sat in the back and rushed out and hoped that nobody would talk to me or didn't want people to see me you know because I was in a new place in my life um, but what I realized was the very thing that I needed was the community that that is here so really when I got to the point where I knew that something needed to be different and I knew I needed to make a, a drastic change I realized that my place was not hiding in the back and I felt for me it was important to not only make a bold declaration to God that I was starting over and that I was wanting to be different. But I really wanted to make that declaration in front of other people. So that was, I, I will never forget, you know, going forward. And I just saw a sea of faces that I did not know and it was terrifying, but immediately there, I was just surrounded by women. Kind of in that moment, you know, God gives you confirmation when you're on the right track. And that's really when I knew, okay, like these women don't know me at all, but they're here to be, you know, walking alongside me with this journey that, that I'm on. And there was a lot of comfort that came from that. And so I really just realized my place is not hiding in the back. You know, if God gave me a, a talent to, to sing, I need to be singing on the praise team. If God gave me a talent to talk to other people about the Lord, like I need to be doing that. Really once I kind of made that promise to God and I did it in front of people that would uh, hold me accountable, I felt like I was uh, on the right track and once that happened, really everything about my life changed. And it's to the point where other people have noticed a difference in me. The real change comes from just a total submission and deciding that you're just not gonna do it your way anymore and that you're gonna do it God's way. Really, when you do give up all control and give it to God, he, he will lead you exactly where you want to go. But I tell my friends, like, be careful when you tell God to use you because he will absolutely put you to work. My name is Courtney, and I've decided to follow Jesus. Deciding to follow Jesus is an invitation that is extended to all of us. And so the question becomes, will you take your next step? I appreciate Courtney and her willingness to share her heart with us this morning. It's been a joy to get to know her, and it's been a joy to have her even in in our connect group lately. Um, last week we had signups for connect groups and it was uh, just a, a great thing to witness uh, the, the different folks that are, are getting plugged into different small group community. Uh, and it's not too late if you haven't made that step yet and I would encourage you to, to consider that. Um, apparently the, the most popular group in our church now is pickleball. Uh, we'll, there's like 600 of you here and 700 of you signed up for pickleball, small group. Um, so I guess I can't be talking about pickleball anymore from the pulpit. Um, but seriously, there, there is a number of, of places for you to plug in. And as Courtney alluded to in the video, it can, it can be scary. It can be terrifying, you know, to, uh, to, to place yourself in, in, in a small group community. Uh, but I hope that you will continue prayerfully considering to do just that. Uh, we've explored the commitments of following Jesus to worshiping regularly and connecting with God, how that leads us to living differently and doing life together. And today, for a few moments, I want us to consider what it means to give generously. Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 11. While they were listening to this, what were they listening to? Well, if you go back in Luke chapter 19, the story right before this is the story of who? It's the story of Zacchaeus, the wee little man. And, and Jesus is in Zacchaeus' house, and he is saying that salvation has come to this house today because he came to, to seek and to save the lost. And this is what they are hearing and then the word says in verse 11, while they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable. Because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. 
the disciples continued to be confused by the nature of the kingdom that Jesus spoke about. Uh, Many of them imagined God's kingdom to be a a restoration of Israel's old days of, of political and military glory. And they had difficulty conceiving a kingdom that included all who believe, male and female, Jew and Gentile rich and poor so speaking into their confusion jesus tells a parable a story verse 12 he said a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return so he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minus Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. This was a man of noble birth, presumably a prince of sorts. And by the command that is giving, there's really three at least three implications that we can place onto the text. Uh, Implication number one is that the servants did not own the the minas or or the money. It was just theirs to manage. A mina is in some uh, circles is expected to be three or four months worth of wages. So you can kind of do the math on some of that. The second implication is that the servants had to find creative ways to invest in order to gain a return. Thirdly, that that one day there was going to be an accounting of how the resources were used. So I want you to hold those three implications in mind as we continue to read verse 15. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, take charge of five cities. Now, we don't know exactly what these servants invested in. Maybe uh, they bought some land and developed it. Uh, Maybe they invested in the NASDAQ, the Nazareth deck. Maybe uh, they bought some camels and they started the the very first uh, Uber driving camel business back in the day. We don't know what they did in order to invest the money. But catch this, wherever they invested the money and established the prince's presence, there was a form of his kingdom. Don't miss this. To say it another way, that the prince's kingdom did not have political boundaries It was where his servants were working in his name, using his resources, gaining profit for his glory. There was his kingdom. Jesus' followers who want to live generously are also servants. No more and no less. Verse 20, then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you. Because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you? that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit 
so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest. Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. Sir, they said, he already has 10. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as far as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Hmm. Often uh, we hear the word give or giving and automatically our, our minds go to uh, money. And money is, is certainly something that could be included in that, but it goes deeper than that. In his book, The Secrets of the Generous Life, author Gordon MacDonald says that the generous life is not about doling out extra amounts of money. It is about reorienting the human heart in the direction of Christ so that we become transmitters of the same affection and care that Christ modeled here on earth. Uh, Mother Teresa, who died in the late 90s, uh, she rejected any view of her life as an activist. In her Nobel Prize acceptance speech, she claimed that anyone who, who viewed her life as being about social work had it backwards. In, in reality, she claimed that she, along with her fellow servants, were nothing more than contemplatives in the heart of the world. What she was saying was that everything that she was being awarded for, caring for the poor, rehabilitating those with addictions, creating a community of love in a poor slum, that all of it accidentally happened in response to prayer. It was simply a natural response to being with Jesus. In other words, her life was about being with God. And she was responding accordingly. Mother Teresa wasn't an activist. She was a person of prayer. I've been so encouraged by our uh, 21 days of prayer, the emails that we've received every day. If you're not on our email list, uh, we would love to, to put you on that. Just contact the church office or use the online connection card. Let us know about that. But I've been encouraged by that. Some of you have even contacted me and said, I wish we could, could keep it going. <laughs> and, and so I, I'm planning to go back through the 21 days. I've saved them in my email, and, and I, I hope that you will join me in going back through the prayers that our brothers and sisters have offered over the past few weeks. In Mark chapter 12, it's Passover week. It's the last of Jesus' days here on the earth, and it's been a long day. And his, his critics have just been asking him question after question after question. They've been pelting him with questions. Those of us who have young children in the house, you kind of know how this feels. It's the why, and what is this, and what does this mean, and how, and, and all of those questions that come. But Jesus was receiving these on, on yet another level and he finally gets this moment with his disciples. And you know what Jesus does? Jesus goes and he watches the contribution. Mark chapter 12, verse 41. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins, worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. I mean, think about that. This is the, the last day 
one of the last days of Jesus' public ministry. I mean, of all the things that he could be choosing to do with his disciples, what does he do? He watches people give. And writings tell us that in the temple that the containers were not like the containers that we have out here in the foyer. The containers in the temple were, were metal. And so when someone came by with a large amount of coins and put them in the metal container, what sound do you think it made? Clank, 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 clank. Everybody heard it. But only Jesus heard the pee, pee. He said, hey, guys, hey, guys, did you hear that? Did you hear what just happened? Did you hear what she just did? This woman illustrated what Jesus had taught just a few verses earlier. Look back in verse 28. Okay, Rabbi. There's over 600 commands in the Old Testament. Which one's the most important? Mark 12, 29. Jesus doesn't say the answer that most of us would give. Well, they're all important. No, he directly addresses the question. He says the most important one, answer Jesus, is this, hear, Shema, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. For there is no greater commandment than these. What the woman did was the most religiously pure act of worship that he saw all week. She loved God with everything that she had. We tend to measure love by how much you give. Jesus measures love by how much you keep. This woman emptied herself. We tend to focus on amount. God focuses on capacity and attitude. What was your capacity to give and what was your attitude when you gave it? I want to offer us uh, just a few takeaways today. And I hope that you'll continue to discuss these in your small groups. Number one is this, is that generous living is more often a measure of one's soul than of one's pocketbook. Jesus said, the poor widow was at the head of the line of those who live generously. On November 19th, 1863, the featured speaker for the dedication of the Gettysburg National Cemetery was not Abraham Lincoln. It was Edward Everett a former dean of Harvard University and one of the most famous speakers of the day, he spoke for two hours. How many of y'all would be letting me go today if I went for two hours? Then Lincoln delivered his message, which took less than two minutes. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. This nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. Here's what's fascinating to me, is that Everett, the guy who spoke for two hours, 
He wrote Lincoln a note after the fact. And here's what Everett said to Lincoln. I wish that I could flatter myself that I had come as near to the central idea of the occasion in two hours as you did in two minutes. My prayer is that we don't miss the central idea of generous living. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, Paul would say it this way. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Students, church, we give because he gave. And because he gave, we follow by not burying our time and our talent and our treasures, but by offering them as a sacrifice to God. I want you to take a moment and watch part two of our sister Courtney's story. So the the Sunday that I decided that I wanted this to be my church home just happened to be the Sunday that the ministries were being uh, displayed and and showing all the different ways that you could be involved. And once again, you know, when I told God to use me, there it was, you know, a million different ways that I could be involved. So, you know, I signed up for what I could. But in the process of doing that, I was invited to come and attend a connect group. Had never, you know, gone to one before. So I just went along because I had gotten the invitation. It was terrifying because in a place where you don't know anybody, okay, now we're gonna be in a smaller intimate setting with people that I don't know, but once again, you know, God, God knows what we need and he puts us in the places that we need to be in. You know, I was not uncomfortable at all. I was met with welcome faces. I was surrounded by people that didn't just look like me and weren't in just my same place in life. And that meant a lot to me that there were different ages represented, that there were different people just in different stages of life that not only I felt like I could learn from, but that I could be of a blessing to with my story and with what I'm going through. And really it just took the beautiful community that I really found here at Homewood and brought it into like a small intimate family. And these are just people that they know my mess, they know like what I'm going through, but they are right there along with me sharing their mess and praying with me. I end up leaving worship sad that it's over i end up leaving bible class sad that it's over and then i end up leaving connect group sad that it's over just because i'm so spiritually fed and it's god showing me you know confirmation that i'm exactly where i need to be and in a place where i'm loved and i'm blessed and i'm taken care of but i also have that opportunity to to get to work and bless other people Second takeaway is that generous living is a life shared in common unity. This is some of what Jeff Taylor was sharing during our communion thoughts. I was talking with uh, someone yesterday who does not go to this church. And we just got to talking uh, about life. And I was telling him that, you know, our church family uh, just has multiple people and families that are are walking through some very hard things right now. And uh, I got to tell him just how, you know, my heart, my minister heart is that I want to be present with all of them, you know, and I want to be there. But the reality is, is I'm, I'm one person. I can't, you know, I mean, we, our shepherds are are the same way. There's only a, a certain amount that can't, we can't be everywhere all the time. But I've been so encouraged by a faith family that has come alongside these families and, and that has supported and has prayed for and has uh, shown and walked in love in a way that you can't really articulate or, or put words around. And I, I was so proud. to call you my church family yesterday.
Because generous living is a life that is shared in common unity. Which leads us to number three. That generous living begins in worship and emerges from a grateful heart. One of the most sobering texts in all the Bible is found in the book of Job. He receives word that his property has been stolen or destroyed, that his children have all lost their lives, all of them. In Job 1 and 20, the word says, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell on the ground and worshiped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. He goes on in chapter 13 to say, Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. Let's pray this morning. Father, I pray that you will give us the courage and the humility to be obedient in whatever season of life we find ourselves in. Father, give us hearts that are are grateful for the one who became poor so that we may experience the richness of a life in him. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Remind us that even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that it's your perfect love that is casting out fear. Father, may we proclaim that with boldness this morning. It's in your name, the name above all names that we pray, the name that one day will be heard and every knee will bow. The name of Jesus. Amen. If you have a a need this morning, there'll be a shepherd down front. If you'd like to pray with one of our shepherds and his spouse back here in the chapel, feel free to do that. Today's the day you want to name Jesus as Lord. Be baptized into him. I'd love to celebrate that with you. Come as we stand and sing.